so as Michelle introduced me, I'm Steve McMillan. I'm a PhD student here at Dalhousie in the Oceanography Department. Uh, today I'm taking off the PhD hat and talking about an initiative uh, that we've kind of undertaken as a student society, uh, graduate student society, and it's an attempt to make our research as graduate students accessible to what we call non-experts. Uh, so people just with a general curiosity on the ocean. And uh, this is in the form of two magazines. So we have the first volume and the second volume. And I'm going to get into you know, kind of what the magazine is all about and what we are, are trying to uh, achieve. All right, so a couple months ago, I wrote a blog post for Canoe, and I started it off with, you know, no matter what situation you're in, within five minutes of meeting someone, the question of, well, what do you do for a living is often asked. Uh, so my answer could be, well, I am a physical oceanographer. I assess the turbulence levels in a high Reynolds number tidal channel using measurements from both acoustic Doppler current profilers and shear boats. <laughs> so that is what I've spent the last four and a half years doing. But if I were to say this to someone, it's, well, I'm, I haven't said these words exactly, but you know, if you, if you dive too much into the details, you get you know, blank stares, or the response sometimes is, whoa, you must be so smart. And that, that doesn't engage conversation, it doesn't um, stimulate kind of interest. So maybe a better answer would be, I am involved in a research project where we are trying to determine the best location for underwater turbine and <coughs> funding. We go out and deploy instruments from a fishing boat, which allows us to measure how fast the currents are at various locations. So I'm saying the same thing, I'm just using different words, making it more general, using terminology that people are more familiar with, and something like this, especially this week, you might be like, oh, I read about that in the Chronicle Herald. I just had an uh, email from my supervisor. There's a story in the Chronicle Herald today about these turbines, so it engages conversation, and it's uh, maybe more beneficial in some ways about educating people about the ocean. So going back to current tides, I thought I'd structure the talk in terms of the who, what, where, when, why, and how of the magazine, just to give a general overview of uh, what it is. So, first the what. Well, it is a research magazine, but the articles are written in a style that emulates popular science magazines. So I've used the example of National Geographic. So it's not a really easy read. I mean, there is science in it. Um, it's, it's not a story. It's talking about our research and what we do and what we found. But the idea is that it sits on a coffee table, you pick it up, you scroll through, there's lots of pictures, lots of text, sorry, a little text, lots of pictures, some cartoons. Um, it's supposed to be an enjoyable read that uh, seeks to educate the target audience. Um, we try to say, like, non-experts, so high school students through to undergrads, uh, whether you're a scientist or a non-scientist, it should be accessible uh, to everyone. And it's also interesting, I mean, for me, reading some of the articles that are outside of my field, I learn a lot from them. So it's, it's trying to target a fairly broad audience. So there are two issues, as I said. Each issue has eight articles covering the four sub-disciplines of oceanography, which are geological, biological, chemical, and physical. Uh, this is a picture of the table of contents from the first issue. And kind of the style that we've taken is, so this is just an example of one of the articles, to make a fun title, um, to engage the reader, so a stirring story, but then also have a subtitle describing a bit more of the details. So how turbulence and mixing is caused by shoaling internal waves. You might not know what an internal wave is, but you know, oh, the stirring story, that sounds kind of interesting. You might go to the article and uh, read a bit more about it. I also like the top one here. Uh, this is Fran's article called Fish and Chips, and uh, it's about a new technology to measure fish behavior, activity, and growth. So. You know, having, having some, playing around with our research a bit and, and trying to pull out kind of the fun and exciting aspects of it. So this is sort of what the magazine looks like. I have copies with me here if anybody wants to see them after uh, or take one home. Um, so this is actually my article from the first issue. And the title I used was Extracting Energy from the World's Largest Bathtub. And uh, so this, I put this up just to kind of show the layout. So there is a little text, there's pictures, maps, and in my case, I actually had a cartoon, uh, which was done by uh, Dave Cullen. And uh, it's basically depicting here, hopefully you can see, this is a kind of a map of Nova Scotia. This is supposed to be a bathtub. 
with a huge moon. So kind of the way I start my article was talking about why the tides in the Bay of Fundé are so high. Growing up in Nova Scotia, I did not have an ocean education. I kind of find, found my way to it unexpectedly, and uh, this is something that could easily be taught in high school. The tides in the Bay of Fundé are high for the same reason when you're in a bathtub and you're just pushing the water. So the moon is pulling on the water, but it's pulling on the water at just the right frequency that you get this kind of, it could you know, splash over the tub. That's kind of the analogy that uh, we use. And the strategy of using analogies is something that's kind of common throughout many of the articles to describe complex scientific ideas with different um, things that people are, are a bit more familiar with. All right, so these are two articles from this year's magazine, again, just showing kind of the layout. So we have a geological oceanography article about talking about digging into the past. And this right here is an infographic. So each of the articles in this year's edition had what we call an infographic. So the authors all sketched out something that they thought might help the reader to better understand their work. And then we had a graphic designer kind of put together the final product. So I know it's a little small here, but this is basically showing, showing some you know, sediment and iron being displaced out to sea. It sinks, and then what Diksha does is use cores to look at you know, the history and, and the past, uh, past iron uh, distributions in the ocean. And this is an article from Miriam. Uh, this is a biological oceanography article where she uses these really cool uh, underwater robots to go down and take pictures of the seafloor to try to characterize both you know, what kind of sediments are down there, as well as the uh, different uh, benthic communities. So very vast uh, research uh, is described in, in these eight articles in each issue. And so now getting into the next W, the why. Um, so these are all pictures when I was putting together the magazine that were sent to me as options for cover photos, reverse photos, because we want it to be a very inclusive magazine. And I think this kind of highlights the why. As oceanographers, we get to do some really cool things. We get to see some really interesting things, and we don't often get to share that. Um, so, you know, you have going out to sea and doing uh, water samples to measure the temperature and salinity. You get really cool sunsets, really cool sunrises. This here shows a seal with a, a tag on its, its head. I think this was taken at Sable Island, which is pretty cool. This is from my research. This is not me diving down, but my instruments all go on the bottom, so you know, we get to get these really cool underwater pictures, some near shore applications here, going out and doing field work and just foraging around. So this is what we get to do as grad students. Not every day, obviously, but, but we do get to do some really cool things and it's nice to be able to uh, share that. We do share our research, that's obviously what we do, um, but the venues and the avenues that we usually take to share our results are in the form of these scientific journals, peer-reviewed, discussing the you know, minute details of the science. So limnology and oceanography methods, Ramirez is discussing object-based image analysis to determine seafloor, fine scale features and complexity. Not necessarily something you're gonna read as a high school student or not something you're gonna pick up off the shelf. A, an article by Will Burt in uh, Global Biogeochemical Cycles. If I, as an oceanographer, were to pick up either of these two articles, I probably wouldn't understand half the content or I'd have to do a lot more reading in order to understand the content. So that is not what we're trying uh, to get at. And this goes back a bit into the history of why uh, this came to be. So a couple years ago, we actually had a grad student retreat at Wind Horse Farm, and Dr. Bob Fournier was, he's an emeritus prof in the Department of Oceanography. He gave the keynote lecture, um, and if you're aware, he it does a science segment on CBC Radio once a week bringing new recent scientific discoveries to a very general audience being the radio listeners. So he gave this great keynote speech talking about the importance of communication, the importance of assessing your audience, and uh, Fran, who was at the retreat, who was a grad student at the time, kind of had this idea of like, well, we don't get any training in how to communicate to the media, how to you know, explain our research to a general idea, so it was her idea combined with, we had a magazine that was produced from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute sitting on our coffee table in the lounge for a year or more. And she said, well, we can do this. Why can't we do this? This is a great initiative. So that's kind of the history of, as to why the magazine was first produced. The Who, a lot of people are involved in this magazine. These are all of the authors from the two issues. 
So there's 16 articles, 15 different authors, so it is very much a team effort. Each of the articles, one thing that's nice is we have a little bio about the authors where they can write whatever they want, but it tends to be um, describing you know, what their background is, how they got into oceanography, maybe a little bit about their extracurricular activities, so you kind of get a sense of like who the authors are and why they're studying uh, what they're studying. But there's more than just the authors involved. So these are the editors. So in the first issue, we had three or four editors um, covering all of the articles. For the second issue, I was the editor-in-chief. And what I did is I recruited eight or seven others editors so that each article had two editors per, per article. And the strategy being that if it was a physical oceanography article, we had a physical oceanographer review it as well as someone from a different subdiscipline that we can really focus on not using jargon, because that's one of the harder things to do um, when you're so used and so immersed in your research, to kind of take a step back and not use um, that scientific terminology. So I think that strategy works pretty well, having uh, a lot of editors and a pretty big team. The when, uh, so 2013 was the first issue, 2015 was the second issue, so this was just released at the end of the year last year. So part of why I'm here and part of what we're doing is trying to promote the magazine to be have it in print, we want to get it out to as many different uh, venues as possible. And, and that's the strategy, we are trying to do it in, a, in, in every two year um, frequency just because it, it is a lot of work to put this together. The where, well it's obviously produced here in Halifax, it's out of the Department of Oceanography as I said, um, but I just thought I'd put on here these orange dots represent where the research that's described in the articles is found. So most of it is off the Scotian shelf, they have funding because that's where we're located, so that's where most of the research goes on. But there's one article from the Southern Ocean, the Equatorial Pacific, you know, North Sea, off the coast of Norway. So we are kind of looking at different aspects of the ocean because the ocean is a global, um, a global system. And then the yellow dots represent where we've distributed the magazine. So um, this is but definitely not comprehensive. Anytime a department uh, or a seminar happens in the department and the speakers from away, we send them away with a copy of the magazine, so who knows where it's ended up. Hopefully it's on coffee tables all over the world. These are kind of some of the targeted places we've sent it to different conferences, different oceanographic institutes, uh, but it would be great to kind of expand uh, our distribution. Uh, and then into the last bit, so the how. It's a very standard uh, procedure, I think, for producing a magazine. We start with recruiting authors and editors. Sometimes you have to kind of pull their leg a little bit, like, I really need a geological oceanography article. Can you please write one? Sometimes there's some hesitation, but I think by the, in the end, people actually are, are happy that they took part in the process. We write the articles, edit the articles. We send it to the graphic designer who does some of the infographics and the layout, edit the layout, and then print and promote. So fairly standard. It's not quite linear, so obviously writing it Writing the articles and editing the articles, we go back and forth for quite a while, six months. The first versions of the articles were not good. I'm not going to sugarcoat it, it's just, you know, you're so used to writing a scientific paper, and it was kind of like, how can we engage the reader? How can we make our research interesting? You don't want to dive right in, you want to tell a little bit of a story, especially at the start. Um, so that, that definitely took a long time, uh, but it was worth it. And then this graphic design and layout was also took a lot longer than I maybe expected because we would send our sketches to the graphic designer, he would do it, but he might have changed something a little bit. And then, you know, for example, so one one was a current com a, a current coming, a freshwater current coming, it turns to the right because of the Coriolis force. Well, when the graphic designer drew it, he didn't draw it going to the right. But that's the key fundamental aspect of the science, so it, it had to be right. And so this, this process kind of took took quite a quite a while, but uh, Thankfully, our graphic designer, James Goody, was very patient uh, with me and always willing to kind of fix things that, that were really bothering me. Um, so he was a student, not in the department, but he was an ASCAD student, I think. In the first version, he now has his own company, but he's still willing to, to help us out, which is really great. Um, the whole process takes about a year, I would say. Funding applications are kind of ongoing throughout the process just because it's, it's not, uh, not really cheap. We have to pay the graphic designer and we have to pay to print the magazine. The department pays for about 100 copies because they want to use, it's great promotional material for them, um, but we also pay for some of our own. Um, and here are the sponsors. So mostly associated with Dow, grad students, faculty of grad studies, 
Neil Pryor helped us out this year, Karen Bogenography, and uh, a couple others. And with that, I will say thank you. And the article is, the magazines are both available online. Digital copies are free. Um, I do have you know, several copies today if people are interested. Um, or you can send me an email if you have any questions. Thank you. Um, email that tells you about cool events, opportunities we've been talking about.